Hello and thank you for listening to our iStart PIA Relay podcast series brought to you by NIHR Dementia Researcher. iStart is a professional society and part of the Alzheimer's Association, representing scientists, physicians and other dementia professionals active in researching and understanding the causes and treatments of Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. In this five-part series, we've asked members of iStart professional interest areas to take turns at interviewing their colleagues and being interviewed themselves. Confused? Don't worry, it'll all become clear as the week progresses. We'll be releasing one of these podcasts every day in the build-up to the Alzheimer's Association International Virtual Conference to showcase the work of iStart PIAs. Thank you for listening. Well, hello everyone and thanks for joining us. I'm David Scott. I'm an anesthesiologist uh, based at St Vincent's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia, and I'm a professor at the University of Melbourne as well. I chair the perioperative cognition and delirium professional interest area. Uh, but today I'm delighted to be talking with Professor Henrik Zetterberg. Now, Henrik's in Gothenburg now, and I'm in Melbourne now, so we're almost exactly at opposite sides of the planet. Uh, hi, Henrik. Could you tell us a bit about yourself and uh, your peer? Hello, Dave. Uh, thanks for, for um, having me. Uh, my name is Henrik Zetterberg. I'm a professor of neurochemistry in Erin Gothenburg, University of Gothenburg, and also at University College London, uh, where I run a bio, fluid biomarker lab at the Dementia Research Institute. Uh, to me, it's been super interesting to see the two different ways of handling the COVID pandemic because my London lab is completely closed, and we are, but we are open here in Gothenburg trying to do our work the best we can. Oh, so it's, it's, been, it's been a special, a very special spring this. Um, yeah, so I, I chair the biofluid based uh, biomarker PIA. Uh, and we are focusing, actually the PIA started with, with um, a big focus on um, uh, cerebrospinal fluid measurements, but uh, recent developments in this field uh, with ultra sensitive measurement techniques have really made it possible to transfer some of the CSF biomarkers to um, blood tests. So we renamed the PIA to, to make sure that the, the, these developments were, were, were covered in the work we, we do. And there we have been able to uh, work across the different uh, PIAs much more, not, not the least with your PIA, Dave, uh, looking at brain effects of, of uh, anesthesia uh, and, and such things. Yeah, so so let's let's start with um, I guess CSF, which is the biofluid that you presumably started with, particularly with your link with Alzheimer's disease. So, is CSF um, old-fashioned now? Do we need to bother about collecting CSF samples, or is CSF still the gold standard for biofluid uh, biomarkers? And what can we learn from CSF biomarkers? Oh, that's a great question. And, and uh, uh, of course, I love CSF and I'm very CSF biased. Uh, it's a beautiful body fluid, the best body fluid one could think of. Clear, nice, uh, uh, easy to work with. It's very easy to measure biomarkers in cerebrospinal fluid because of its proximity to the brain tissue. So, I mean, the idea is that uh, CSF communicates uh, rather freely with the brain interstitial fluid and then bio, bio, biochemical changes in the brain should be directly reflected in the CSF. But of course that is an oversimplification because I mean CSF is to a large extent the plasma filtrate and the, the minority of the volume comes from the interstitial fluid in the brain. So around 70 to 80 percent comes from plasma. But the remaining uh, percentages are brain derived. And it has been easier to measure CNS molecules in CSF because the concentrations are often around 50 to 200 fold higher in CSF of the brain derived molecules. Um, so so uh, I think that is the, tra the, 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 the traditional reason for why CSF has been a preferred um, uh, biofluid to study brain diseases. Um, yeah. But then there have been extremely nice developments in, in um, uh, the measurement technologies. And uh, now we have 
uh, techniques like single molecule array, like single legs, and also proximity uh, ligation assays and uh, other amplified uh, other assays where you can amplify the signal of the measurement. Better mass spectrometry based methods also, and then we have been able to measure many of these molecules in blood. Yeah, so we've we've we've, we've it's been a, quite a few years since we heard about um, you know the the triad, if you like, of 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 A, beta, and tau, and P, tau, and uh, how in CSF there was this fingerprint almost of potentially uh, an indication for the presence of Alzheimer's disease or even the severity of Alzheimer's disease. Mm. Um, does that still hold true, or do we have better biomarkers now? Yep, the, 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 this triad still is still highly relevant. And if we start with the amyloid pathology, uh, of course you can measure it with amyloid PET, and then you get anatomic information. But for amyloid pathology, that anatomic information has turned out to not to be very important, at least not in the symptomatic disease stages. Uh, the best fluid biomarker for amyloid pathology is the ratio of 42 amino acid long beta amyloid to 40 amino acid long beta amyloid. And that has a very nice concordance with amyloid PET. So from my perspective, these are almost interchangeable trying to transfer the amyloid test to blood test has been challenging. But recently, there are now um, a number of publications indicating that the plasma beta 42 to 40 ratio actually pinpoints amyloid pathology as determined by amyloid PET or the CSF beta 42 40 ratio rather well. But there is a problem with amyloid as a molecule because it is also expressed in blood platelets and released from blood platelets. It's expressed in the liver and some other known CNS tissues. So in CSF, there is a 50% reduction in ratio, but in plasma, the reduction, if you're amyloid positive, but in plasma, the reduction is 14, 15, 16%. And that makes it hard to reliably measure such a small difference. And then the, t the tests must be very precise. But the mass spec based tests that have been developed um, in Japan by Nakamura et al. and also in St. Louis by the Randy Bateman team, they, they, look, um, they, they, they look really promising, although it will be a little bit problematic. Uh, so we are now having simple blood tests for amyloid pathology. We can do them in CSF and we have amyloid PET. And depending on where you are in the world and how your study is designed, you could use these different markers. And perhaps you could also use them in se sequentially if needed to increase the specificity of the test. So you're certainly drawing, uh, you've drawn the connection between your work and the work of your peer with uh, Alzheimer's disease. And uh, the, I mean, this, this, the possibility of, of blood tests has always been the holy grail, hasn't it, for yeah. determining whether someone has an illness or not and how severe that illness is. Um, Perhaps, perhaps you should tell us a bit more about these highly sensitive small molecule assays. Yeah, uh, I could just also briefly touch base on, on the tau part of this spectrum and also mention neurodegeneration rapidly. Uh, so, for example, with, with tau, uh, we have, of course, big advantages with tau PET imaging because then we get anatomic information and that really seems to correlate with clinical expression of, of uh, uh, the disease. So the, the brain regions in which tau accumulates uh, will uh, reveal what types of symptoms uh, there might be. And it also correlates strongly with neurodegeneration. The fluid tests for tau pathology are not, and do not give this anatomic information, which is a drawback. But CSF phospho tau is still a reliable uh, test to detect the tau phosphorylation that sort of precedes uh, tangle formation and um, uh, the development of neuritic um, dendrites. So, and this test has also been made into a blood test with an ultra-sensitive uh, method, which is, uh, which I will touch upon uh, uh, shortly regarding how that works. For neurodegeneration, we have magnetic resonance imaging of the brain as the gold standard um, method, and then also, of course, uh, FTG PET. Uh, but there we, uh, we have two biomarkers that have been discussed a little bit in regards to what information they might bring. We have CSF total tau, which traditionally has been regarded as a neurodegeneration marker. Now, I, I and many other researchers think that 
neurons exposed to amyloid will respond to that pathology by phosphorylating and secreting both total tau and, and phospho tau. It's not really neurodegeneration, the total tau measure, but, but uh, perhaps something that will predict neurodegeneration. Um, the best uh, fluid biomarker for neurodegeneration in general is neurofilament light, which is an in, also an interaxonal protein that leaks out from injured axons. So total tau is surprisingly AD specific as a biomarker, whereas neurofilament light is more general, uh, more general neurodegeneration marker. So that is how we try to use them now. And both phosphorylated tau uh, and neurofilament light have been made into blood tests that correlate with CSF levels and also uh, with the imaging evidence of, of um, tau pathology and neurodegeneration. And what has happened is that the traditional immunoassays where, where you capture the target analyte between two antibodies, a capture antibody and the detector antibody, which is labeled by, by some means. Those assays have now been transferred onto, onto single molecular array where you have the capture antibody to magnetic beads. And then you pull down magnetic beads with the analyte into small, small microwells and one bead will fit into one microwell. And then you will be able in the instrument to, to, to add um, the substrate of the enzyme with which the detector antibody is labeled. And then the, if there is analyte present, there will be light emission. And then this will go, happen on almost like a Chinese chessboard like grid where you image um, emission of light and then you can count molecules one by one. So if the fluid you are measuring on is diluted so that most microwells will not emit light, you will know that the, those that do contains one, contain one analyte. If they contain two analytes, they will emit twice as much light. If they contain three analytes, they will contain, uh, emit three times as much light. So, and this has made it possible to, to have very sensitive assays with low uh, low limit of quantification and also a quite nice dynamic range because you can also capture the, um, the, the analogous uh, signal. So you can also measure high concentrations. S uh, the, the, this principle is called single molecule counting or single molecule. Yep, you, you, you count, um, you have this digital component to the assay and there are similar techniques that, that work uh, along similar lines of, of um, um, yeah, and, and they sort of all can achieve this yeah. type of uh, ultra so you're sensitivity. Describing, you're describing a process with incredible sensitivity mm. and clearly uh, moving into very exciting areas. And it was very reassuring, I'm sure, for the neuroimaging peer that uh, there's still some value left with doing some um, structural imaging uh, yeah. of the brain. Uh, that's excellent and very reassuring. Um, just talking a little bit about the peer itself, Henry. Um, who formed your peer? What type of um, people are in your peer? What type of, uh, are there scientists, are there clinicians? Uh, how does that work? It's a very mixed composition of the PIA. There are uh, researchers, many of these researchers are biomarker um, uh, researchers who work in a focused manner on improving the analytical techniques to measure these molecules. So it's rather uh, sort of chemical to some extent. <laughs> then we have biotech people uh, and people from, from um, the diagnostic uh, industry. So it's a rather uh, industry intense uh, PIA. And yes, then we yeah, have- When you come uh, out and talk to us, we understand what you're saying. It makes sense. So that's a credit to you and your members. Uh, then another category is of course, uh, clinical cohort owners who want to keep up with the latest developments in, in, in um, uh, fluid biomarkers. Uh, I mean, many epidemiologists and genetic researchers are now starting to use the blood uh, based biomarkers as endophenotypes to discover um, uh, uh, risk factors, not just for the clinical phenotype, but also for a molecular pathology or a polygenic risk score, for example, for tau pathology and not just the clinical phenotype. So, so that type of work is ongoing quite intense, intensively now. So, so are these, these uh, small molecule assays and the highly sensitive assays, are they ready for clinical uh, application in research, in epidemiologic research or clinical research? Uh, and are they, how close are they to clinical use? Yeah, actually two weeks ago, we started to measure neurofilament light in plasma here in Gothenburg in our clinical laboratory practice. 
so now we use it as a general marker of neuronal injury. And we get samples, for example, from primary healthcare physicians. Uh, one sample was sent a few uh, days ago from, from a, a patient who was uh, around, yeah, well, in her 20s, and she complained about numbness to her right hand. And she told uh, the physician that she had a little bit of numbness in her left foot uh, a while ago. And this physician was, wanted to check if this was perhaps indicative of multiple sclerosis. Mm. Um, so, so it's, uh, but one could also think about uh, persons seeking med medical advice because of memory problems. And then one would use neurofilament light as a sen rather sensitive test for neurodegeneration. Uh, and then if that is positive, one could perhaps then speed up the, the referral of the patient to a memory clinic for more advanced um, examination. We hope to do this for plasma phosphatau also. So you're not putting the clinicians out of work either just yet. That's excellent. Uh, no, actually, they, they, uh, <laughs> of course, there is a worry that this will generate more questions than answers. Um, yeah, 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 and yeah. Uh, that, I mean, that can happen with new tests. But I think we, uh, I, I I am. Um, I, I think that we, those these types of developments will teach us a lot. But of course, one has to be careful discussing with the patient if he or she really wants new tests to be done, because um, uh, so, so that the patient is uh, feeling comfortable with what with, with what such a result might lead to. Of course, we hope in this PIA that there will be disease modifying treatments for, for perhaps for several neurodegenerative diseases in the, in the future. And then this type of work might guide treatment um, advice in, uh, and perhaps it could also speed up how fast p patients could uh, get access to different uh, treatments, at least if the phosphatau and A-beta tests become, become um, uh, standardized for, for clinical laboratory practice use. Uh, so that, then, but we, we think that this might be, a, Perhaps this will be the most important work for our PIA in the upcoming years, how to make the assays fit for purpose in clinical laboratory practice, help with what, how to interpret the biomarker results, and perhaps also help how to communicate the results with the patients, because many of these biomarkers change so early in the disease process. And of course, we might do patients a disfavor if someone has slight memory problems and sought medical advice 10 years ago, perhaps he or she would be reassured that this commonly happens with aging a little bit and it doesn't seem to be that bad and left, the patient would be left without a diagnosis. Now it might be that the patient comes and gets an early Alzheimer's diagnosis, perhaps 10 years earlier than, than, uh, than what would have happened 10 years ago. And um, then we have to be extremely careful with redefining or rebranding what Alzheimer's disease is, and that you can live with this disease and function quite well over an extended time period. Uh, I mean, the, the worst thing that could happen with such a biomarker support diagnosis, if this becomes a reality in the future, in the clinics is that the patients get an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis and then think uh, thinks that, that uh, he will get he or she will be like uh, perhaps a, an old relative with Alzheimer's disease that he or she has met. And uh, yeah, there, are, yeah. there are certainly many um, significant issues with yeah. respect to diagnosis, just not the number on a on a lab report. That's absolutely mm. correct. Uh, the person really needs to be considered. Yeah. Um, just briefly, you've also been doing work in some acute changes as well, yeah. uh, I understand. Uh, delirium obviously comes comes to mind. You've talked about neurodegenerative diseases, but where does delirium sit in all of this with respect to your work? Yeah, I, I think this is so exciting. Uh, and um, uh, so the way we have interacted with your PIA, for example, the, the hypothesis have been, the, there have been a number of hypotheses that uh, need to be addressed and they need to be tested further, of course. And that is the vulnerable brain concept that if you have a brain with uh, clinically silent pathologies having accumulated 
and then you are challenged by having to go into intensive care or, or doing surgery under general anesthesia uh, or something else stressful, that that would give you an increased risk of developing, of getting confused by the whole thing and getting uh, developing delirium. That's one thing. Is this, could silent, for example, Alzheimer pathology or neurofilament light in the upper range before the procedure, would that predict um, the, 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 would that predict delirium? That's one thing. The other question is if delirium is um, injuring the brain. So if you have a prolonged time of delirium, will that, will that uh, injure the brain and cause harm uh, by itself? Uh, and that we can now start to play around with a little bit with these blood biomarkers. Mm. And yeah, it's I, a bit of chicken and egg situation, isn't it? The, yeah, exactly. A bit of both going on, do you think? The bomb oh, uh, and absolutely. also the brain being injured by delirium. Yeah, it could be a, it could be that type of process that, uh, I and I think the data that we start seeing published now, they are, um, uh, well, mildly supportive of both concepts. I think. Or what would you say, Dave? <laughs> You're not supposed to be asking me questions. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I, I think I don't like the term, but I think delirium is a bit like brain failure. Yeah. Um, and like heart failure to parallel it. So mm. a sick heart will fail, but then the episode of failure actually damages the heart more. Yeah. Yeah. So I think they sort of combine to each other. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Henry, if, if I could move to just uh, the area of introducing new researchers into our fields and your yeah. field in particular, what, what do you think early um, career researchers who are listening can do to become involved if they're suddenly excited by biofluid biomarkers? What should they do? You know, I think that there are, I think there is, uh, but now this is my bias, I have to tell you upfront, but I think learning the analytical techniques, exploring new technologies um, firsthand, uh, learning things that are really cutting edge uh, and learning them in practice, uh, indeed, to really learn the biomarker measurement craft, that is my advice. <laughs> and of course, of course, and this is my other bias, I am not that good at statistics, and especially not bioinformatics and that complicated. I, I really have not been able to keep up with that field. But when I meet young, mostly people who are skilled at this, I, I think there is a lot to, learn, to do here. So, so these are my two things. Either you learn the basic chemistry and the analytical technologies in great, great detail and really make sure to keep up with the field in terms of the cutting edge technologies to, to, to make it. Because I think we, will, we can measure total uh, uh, concentrations of a certain protein, but it has thousands or at least hundreds of isoforms and different modifications. Perhaps one will find interesting things in that. But the other thing is to handle complex data sets with advanced statistics. Uh, I, I could mentor the first part. I could never mentor the latter. Uh, um, but well, I think these are the two things to me. Yeah, your, your enthusiasm comes through, and I think that's another whole mm. element of mentoring that uh, people... Can, can I just rapidly comment on a thing I forgot to, to comment on, Dave, and you brought it up in the beginning. Is there a need to do CSF? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, 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 there is, um, from my perspective, less need if you're interested in brain-derived molecules that... Seem to, I mean, they appear in the blood, and if you have a sensitive enough assay, that's fine. It could be that uh, enzymes and pro proteases and so it could mess up the biomarker in the blood so that the blood is worse as a biofluid than CSF, but I think that is solvable. The part where I really think CSF is needed is if you're interested in inflammatory processes or and, and actually also, to a large extent, synaptic homeostasis and endosomal vesicular recycling and such things, lysosomal proteins. Um, biomarkers that are generally expressed across uh, tissues um, because then the blood levels will be influenced more by what is released from example uh, immune cells th than what it is from the brain or the microglia in the brain. For, yeah. so, so there I think if you do a CSF sampling you will have a gr greater chance of seeing something microglia or astrocytic related than if you look in the blood. So that's the uh, inflammation, uh, microglial activation, 
endosomal vesicle recycling lysosomal function, such things that I think you would still uh, gather additional knowledge by doing CSF examinations. That's, uh, so it's what you're saying in one, one way is it's very hard to uh, disentangle peripheral information from central information yeah. unless you sample centrally. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, again, is a whole other area of, of uh, exciting research which can be done. Uh, so you, we, I guess we're all disappointed that we won't all be face-to-face -face, uh, at the AAIC this year. Um, is your peer going to be presenting nonetheless? Yeah, we are. Uh, I'm a bit uncertain exactly how it will be arranged now, but we will uh, have presentations from young researchers uh, like we had last year. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which date that will happen, but that was so fun uh, last year. Uh, and um, so we, we decided to repeat it exactly like we did, but uh, over Zoom then. Uh, and then we uh, this year we will also have a prize uh, to the to the uh, high, highest uh, ranking um, uh, abstract, uh, which I think that could also be a good encouragement uh, to have that type of. But just being selected to present is a prize in itself. But but uh, uh, we, we we try to um, uh, we will try to use the PIA activities to help networking and um, I mean that's the main challenge now that we can't meet in, in the, and there are many people seeking I mean postdocs and uh, joy, uh, jobs and so and new projects new pro projects new collaborations um, all those things have to happen and it's good because it's not just the junior people needing to interact with uh, senior group leaders, senior group leaders need to find uh, excellent people to the team. So, so we are all in the same boat and we will try to use the PIA to help uh, with such um, interactions. Uh, thanks very much, Henrik. Uh, and I guess you've emphasized the underlying principle of the PIA, isn't it, which is networking and sharing of ideas and, and forming collaborations, uh, which uh, your, your PIA has done very well and, and we've benefited from that as well. So, um, Thank you very much, Henrik Zetterberg, for joining us today. Thank you so much for listening. You can find details and profiles on today's panellists and information on how to become involved in iStart on our website at dementiaresearcher.nihr.ac.uk and also at alts.org forward slash iStart. We'll be back tomorrow with the next recording of in our I Start PIA Relay podcast series. Finally, please remember to subscribe, like and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify and all the other places where you find your podcasts. Thank you. <laughs>